Um, yeah, so in the second part of the talk, I want to move away from connectivity. Uh, I kind of, um, seriously, um, and I also want to move away from explicitly um, talking about sketches. And so um, I guess everyone I lost probably in the first half of the talk is no longer here. But if you came back by mistake, you got lost in the first half, feel free to re-engage because nothing I said in the first half is going to be that important for the second half. OK, so matchings. So everyone's familiar with the basic definition. Like, you, know, you have a graph, um, a subset of edges, so that no two edges share an endpoint, is a matching. And a fairly classic problem in, um, uh, uh, classic problem in, in algorithms is find the matching of largest size in a graph, and the maximum matching. OK, so the story um, in um, the streaming setting is going to be the first result we're going to talk about is um, on the assumption that the matching in the graph is has a, uh, um, is at most a certain size. So we're going to be kind of um, assuming that we have a graph and the size of the maximum matching is at most k. So I'm going to present an, a sampling-based algorithm that will sample roughly k squared edges from the graph. <coughs> and um, has the property that these k-squared edges will allow you to find the optimal matching in the original graph with high probability. So not, not approximate, but the optimal matching. So yes, this is something that takes k-squared samples. Um, you can implement this in, in the dynamic data stream model, where the edge is being inserted and deleted, uh, using kind of k-squared space. Uh, and it can be also written as a sketch, a k-squared dimensional sketch. Um, so, uh, so this was a paper that appeared in sort of 2016. A related paper uh, by Chris, like kind of um, from ESA 15, said that um, kind of given this promise, they had an algorithm that would one plus epsilon approximate the size of the matching. Um, so, with a very interesting technique um, using kind of like kind of estimating ranks of certain well-defined uh, of certain uh, of certain matrices. Like, so R differs, like, it's, it actually kind of finds the matching, and it's based on this sampling procedure. So that's the first thing I'll talk about. Secondly, um, I'll talk about a result that, um, in this case, we, the matching can be large. Like, you know, maybe the matching could be as large as n, um, n over 2. So we'll show that it's possible to find a T approximation to the maximum matching using um, Oh, pardon me. Um, n squared divided by t cubed samples. Okay, uh, this is not a particularly great approximation result. So, so for example, this says that if you want to only use n samples of, from the graph, then the best you, then um, the approximation factor you're getting is say n to the third, which is a pretty large number. Um, however, it turns out this is optimal, which I think is interesting in its own right. Sorry, as I said, kind of, um, this should be n squared. This should be t to the 3. So if I want n squared divided by t to the 3 to be n, the approximation factor t is going to be roughly kind of n to the third. <coughs> uh, n squared divided by t to the 3 is less than n squared for a large t. Yeah, that, that's what I'm saying. Like, you know, uh, m most of the time in streaming, kind of approximation, you, you want good constant approximations. Like, you know, here, like, you know, um, we're saying there exists an algorithm. It's not going to be. It's going to be an extension of this. Um, like, the algorithm results by itself. The fact you can't get a pro constant approximation, you can only get like kind of poly and n approximation, um, is unfortunate. But it turns out to be tight, and I think it says something about the inherent problem, the inherent toughness of the problem or the structure of matchings, if you like. Um, so uh, this, uh, this paper I was involved in, and this paper both in Soda, um, had this algorithm. Uh, Asadi et al. kind of proved it was optimal. And uh, Christian Conrad and um, the paper Chris was on, they could have um, prove, uh, they could have sub, like, not quite as good at lower bounds as this paper or upper bounds. Um, okay. 
And lastly, um, so um, I, I feel that this was definitely a buzzkill. The, the, the fact that like, you know, the best approximation we can get for this general graph um, is really pretty lousy uh, unless we use pretty much n squared space. Um, so a, a way around this um, is assume your graph has um, some structure. So in particular, you could assume the graph is a planar graph. So um, you, can, like, you can draw the dots on a, uh, on a board, draw the edges, so that you can draw the dots that no edges need to um, intersect. So for such graphs, it's possible to find a constant approximation to the size of the maximum matching um, using n to the four fifth streaming space. So this is not quite a sampling algorithm, but a lot of the ideas are shared uh, with these two results. Um, I kind of, this constant approximation, um, and originally it was a, uh, there was a paper from sort of 2015 that basically kind of gives a lot of the ideas that we then built upon in sort of 2016. Um, the, the constant for all these two papers was roughly 24 for a planar graph. Um, so with what I'm going to present here with recent work with my student, we can push that down to five. Um, we don't think we will be able to push it down further, but you never know. Um, yeah. Okay, so um, those are the three things I want to talk about in the second half. Um, so small matchings, big matchings, and planar matchings. So, uh, yeah, I, I, I apologize. Uh, these pictures were chosen last night. Um, these were the best I could do. Finding, mat finding pictures from matchings is, is somewhat tough. Um, uh, so th this one's okay. Well, it's very hard to find a plane of matchings, but it's possible to find a, a uh, matching planes. So this one, well, this is the big match. Uh, this one's the most obsc obscure, but actually the most technical. So the result here f um, I'm going to present is that um, if the matchings of size less than k, we can find it exactly using k squared samples. Um, more generally, this is actually a kind of a kernelization result. So hence, corn kernels. Um, so, the, so the result is like kind of in the field of fixed parameter retractability and, and kernelization. Um, you can t like, you can. The idea is that you take your original input, say a graph, and you can reduce the size of that graph um, to something much smaller, so that the small graph has a property, even if the original graph has a property. So this kernelization problems uh, results for, for example, vertex cover. That you can take, vertex cover is an np hard problem, but you can take an arbitrary large graph, reduce it to something of size um, kind of k squared um, that has the property that um, the original graph has a vertex cover of size k if and only if the new graph has a vertex cover of size k. Now, of course, you've shrunk the graph, you still need to maybe run a, an exponential time algorithm on the shrunk graph, otherwise you'd have proved come up with a polynomial time algorithm for vertex cover. Uh, same thing applies for matching. There's a way to take an arbitrary large graph, reduce it to a k squared size graph, such that the original graph has a matching of size k in only if, if and only if the new graph has a matching of size k. Uh, so that's uh, a, technique could, a technique called kernelization, um, which was inspiration for picture number one. OK. so. Small matching result I said was going to be based on sampling. So let me show you how this works. And so this is not a name we gave in the paper. Um, it's a name I've used for a couple of talks in the past. And while I don't, well, the name is what it is. We'll call it SNAPE sampling. So SNAPE stands for sample node and pick edge. So the way we're going to pick an edge, so this is, say this is the input graph. And I want to give you a protocol for picking a random edge in this graph. And the protocol is going to be as follows. We're going to pick, um, we're going to sample each node with probability roughly 1 over k, or in general, sample with probability p. And we're going to delete the rest. So maybe we sample those four nodes, and we delete the rest. And then in the remaining graph, we're going to pick a random edge amongst those that re remain. Uh, there's four that remain. Maybe we pick this edge here. And that's the edge I spit out. OK? So we'll call that edge a, a snake sample. Um, now, of course, it is possible that 
Um, the, the edges I picked, the induced subgraph was empty, in which case we'll say the SNAP sample returned a null. Okay. okay, so the result I'm going to prove is that if G has a maximum matching of size at most K, then with K squared log K SNAP samples, we will include, the, um, the set of these samples will include a maximum matching from G. So basically, you have a sample graph, look at the sample graph, find the maximum matching. That's going to have the same size as the maximum matching in the original graph. Um, I'd quite like to, so this is using SNAP samples. Like, it might be useful just to look at why uniform sampling would just like, not work here. So let's suppose we have a, uh, a, gra a layered graph with four layers. Okay, something like that. Let's say um, this is just edges between the third and fourth layer, very simple. Edges between the second and third layer, very simple. Um, and edges here, just crazy. Kind of everything's connected to everybody. I guess you know what a complete bipartite graph looks like, so I don't need to draw the whole mess. OK, something like that. So let's assume that these layers are of size uh, k over 2. And this layer is of size roughly n. I guess technically it should be n minus 3k divided by 2. But um, I hope you'll let me off there. OK, so, so the best matching is of size k. Like if, I guess it would include that these edges here, and k over two edges here, and maybe k over two edges here. And yet, think about what would happen if we did uh, uniform sampling. Like, you know, there are roughly um, n k edges here. And there's only k edges here. Now, if we want to kind of sample a bunch of edges and find a maximum matching, we need to sample every edge here. Because as soon as you lose one of these edges, you're not going to be able to find a matching of size k in the resulting graph. Um, but what's the probability you find you sample one of these edges in uniform sampling? I guess it's 1 divided by nk is the probability if I uniform sample, I return this guy. So I need to repeat this process nk times, so I have constant probability of getting that edge. Okay. Um, so uniform sampling obviously wouldn't cut it. I claim SNAP sampling would cut it. Uh, the general idea is that um, maybe I can preempt some of the, the, the proofs here. Um, I don't take, well, take this graph, for example. So when I do um, SNAP sampling, there's actually a constant probability that all these nasty edges disappear. Like, you remember the first? The first step of SNP sampling was I pick my red, red nose. Um, so if I pick kind of, um, if I don't pick this guy, this guy, this guy, or this guy, or this guy, I don't see any of this mess. And the probability I don't pick any of those guys is roughly uh, um, 1 minus 1 over k to the power of k. So it's kind of constant. And so if I don't pick any of these guys, then this suddenly increases the odds that I'm going to pick one of these things. So this is why SNAP sampling is going to help. So I'm going to prove that. You have to know k. Uh, yes. So for the result, I'm going to prove um, the, the the deal is um, I promise you k. I, pr I promise you an upper bound on k, um, and then we'll find it. Um, in general, uh, y yes. Um, Yes, for, for, for this first section, uh, yes, I definitely want to assume we have an upper bound on k because our sampling parameter depends on k. OK, so <clears throat> the basic idea um, for the analysis is as follows. So, so we're assuming g has a maximum matching of size at most k. I'm going to say a node is heavy if its degree is greater than 10k. I'm going to say an edge is shallow if both endpoints aren't heavy. So 
Uh, these numbers aren't to scale, but like, you know, maybe this is a shallow edge because both of its endpoints are degree just, just kind of three and four in this case. And maybe this is a heavy node because it had many incident edges. Okay. <clears throat> and what you can prove is that a subgraph, G prime, includes a maximum matching of the original graph G if the following two properties are satisfied. Um, if G prime includes all shallow edges in G and every heavy node in G, in the original graph, when you look at the node in the sample graph, it has degree at least 5K. Okay? So an edge that both endpoints have a small degree, that edge is definitely sampled, and edges that have high degree, they still look relatively high degree in the sampled graph. Okay. Um, I'm not going to formally prove it, but the proof idea is as follows. Um, okay. So the only edges missing, the only edges that um, are in G but not in G prime, would be incident to a heavy node, because I collect all the shallow, because by these properties I have all the shallow edges. So maybe these two edges disappear, okay? But every missing edge is incident to some heavy node, okay? And if you've already got kind of 5K incident edges here, and you're only looking for a maximum size at most K, you've got plenty of alternative like, kind of edges to use other than like, kind of, even if you're not allowed to use these two edges anymore. So that's the general idea. I'm not going to formally kind of uh, prove these properties. Like, but I'm definitely going to use this lemma. So what I want to prove is that using Snape sampling, we satisfy these two properties with high probability. And then we'll be done. So that every shallow edge is returned um, as a Snape sample um, with high probability if we do enough Snape samples. And every heavy node is still relatively heavy in the subsampled graph if we do enough Snape samples. Okay. Um, so for the, uh, for the analysis, useful but simple fact is that if we're promising that um, the maximum matching in the graph G has size at most K, then the vertex cover um, of the graph is at most 2K. Because like, if you pick all the endpoints of the matching, that's a vertex cover. And you've, um, that's of size 2K. So we'll call the vertex cover W, and we'll use the fact that W has the number of nodes in the vertex cover is at most 2K. OK, uh, I have no idea whether this is necessary or not. Like, you know, uh, a, a vertex cover is just a subset of nodes such that every edge in the graph is incident to at least one of the nodes in the vertex cover. Uh, any questions? OK, so two things I need to prove about the Snape sampling. So let's do shallow edges first. Let's, let's argue for every shallow edge, I will kind of sample it. Um, amongst my k squared Snape samples with high probability. OK, so the idea is as follows. So let's zoom in on this shallow edge, u and v. If, um, if u and v, so remember Snape sampling, the first step is sample a bunch of nodes. If u and v are amongst the sampled edges, sampled nodes, and no other nodes in the vertex cover are sampled, then it must be the case that all the edges remaining are incident to u or incident to v. Okay, this is the property of vertex cover. Like kind of, um, now, if furthermore, none of the neighbors of u or neighbors of v, other than the edge joining u and v, sorry, if none of the incident edges of u or the instant edges of v. Um, sorry, I was right the first time. If none of the neighbors of u apart from v and none of the neighbors of v apart from u are sampled, then in the induced graph I've got left, the only edge I'll have remaining is between u and v. Okay? So what's the probability of that happening? Um, so if uv is shallow, I'm saying that when I do the Snape sampling and I pick one random edge out of those that remain in the induced subgraph, the probability that this particular shallow edge is that remaining edge is the probability 
that uh, is at least the probability that u and v are both sampled, and no one here is sampled, no one here is sampled, and no one else in w is sampled. So u and v being sampled is, say, p squared if p is the probability I pick a node, so it's 1 over k. And the probability that all those other guys aren't sampled is 1 minus p, so the probability of not sampling something. And I, I don't want to sample the neighbors of u, I don't want to sample the neighbors of v, and I don't want to sample w. So p is roughly 1 over k, so this is 1 over k squared. This is roughly 1 minus 1 over k. This exponent is roughly k, or some constant times k. So this whole thing is constant. I'm left with 1 over k squared, like that. OK. So this was just for one Snape sample. I will sample this shallow edge with probably 1 over k squared. So if I take k squared log k repetitions, if I repeat this sampling procedure a bunch of times, um, then I'll sample the edge uv with high probability. Any questions? OK, awesome. OK, so let's do the heavy node case. Um, so remember, like, you know, we want to argue that after we've taken a whole bunch of Snape samples, that um, this node still looks relatively heavy. It was, a, it was a heavy node initially because it had a degree greater than 10k. We want to argue that after the sampling, it's uh, degrees bigger than 5k with, good pro with high probability. So again, let's think about the vertex cover. So for a heavy U, deleting all the vertex or all the vertices in the vertex cover, aside from perhaps U, leaves a star on U. Okay. Because all edges are instanced either to the vertex cover or U. So if I've deleted everything in the vertex cover apart from U, all remaining edges are incident to U. Um, and I know some of these neighboring nodes may have disappeared, but I'm left with if there was at least 10k neighboring nodes initially, there's at least 8k, because I could have removed the like, uh, at most 2k nodes in the vertex cover. OK? So hence, OK, the probability, like when I do one Snape sample, the probability that an edge incident to u is sampled is um, the probability, again, that all these things aren't picked, which is like kind of uh, at least 1 minus p to the power, to, the, um, to the power 2k, so the vertex cover. And the probability at least one of these edges is picked is pretty much, is very close to the um, expected number of edges that, that were picked. In particular here, it's kind of, uh, there are k edge, there are at least k edges. Each edge is picked with p squared. So the probability that I pick one of these instant edges is roughly k p squared. P is number one, 1 over k, so this, means this is 1 over k. This is constant. So this probability that I get an edge incident to this particular heavy node u is 1 over k, or omega 1 over k. Um, and so again, I'm not just doing the sampling procedure once. I'm doing this k squared log k times. So um, if every time I do it, I, I get an edge incident to u with probably 1 over k, if I repeat this process roughly k squared times, then I expect to get um, kind of order k edges on you. And you can make the constants work out so you get f at least 5k edges on you with high probability. Um, so that was the two things we needed to prove for, um, uh, for small matching. So they kind of, we, we sampled every shallow edge, and for every heavy edge, we sampled enough incident edges to that. So for every heavy node, we sampled enough heavy edges um, on that heavy node. Uh, let's briefly talk about big matchings. Um, the, uh, this is not the way it's written in the paper, um, but I think this is like kind of a suitable way to describe it for the sake of a talk. Um, so I'm going to pr actually prove not. So in, in the slide, I said I would we'd say that n squared divided by t cubed samples would give you a, um, a t approximation. I'm, not gonna, uh, I'm just going to prove one, uh, a theorem that's one step removed from that. That if a matching has size at least k, then with k squared divided by t cubed Snape samples, then you'll find a matching of size k divided by t. Okay. Um, I say this is one step removed. Basically, to get from here to the results I claimed a few slides ago, uh, you just kind of guess k. Kind of like, 
uh, you guess, kind of ge geometric guesses of k, kind of 1, 2, 4, 8, whatever comes after 8, 16, I think. Um, all the way up to n, and so this ends up being n squared divided by t cubed. OK, so let me give you um, a sense of how this proof goes. So the easiest way to analyze the process, or in my opinion, is to think about um, generating the, the sequence of Snape samples one at a time. OK, so we use Snape sampling once, we generate E1, do it again, generate E2, do it again. Oh, wow, OK. Generating um, uh, kind of E3 next, E4, E5, etc. Now, remember, the Snape samples could potentially be null. Like, you know, if, I'd, um, if there are no edges to be picked from the induced subgraph. So some of these are null, um, but other ones are edges. OK, so think about that sequence and consider constructing a greedy matching on that sequence. Like, so the first edge we, we see that isn't null, we add it. And then the next edge we see that isn't null, that's not instant to one of our current edges, we add. Okay. So let's assume as we go through um, that the matching we've constructed is not quite as big as what we hope for. It's like small k over t. And let's analyze the problem. The next thing we see, we can add to the matching. Well, we, the next thing we see, the next Snape sample, we can add to the matching if the graph wasn't empty, so if um, EI isn't a null, and if none of the endpoints of the edges currently in our matching were sampled. OK? Like, like this guarantees that this new thing that's come along, EI, is, is a, a bona fide edge. This guarantees that the edge that we'll get is not incident to one of the, um, our current edges. So the probability uh, this is null roughly ends up being something like p, k p squared. This follows because you're assuming there's a matching of this size at most k. And so you can argue that one of those edges that you haven't found yet shows up with this probability. Um, probability all endpoints in M are deleted, uh, you could argue is, um, I guess, kind of constant, um, because you're assuming you haven't found that many edges so far. You, you haven't, your matching isn't too big so far. So this ends up being constant. This is kp squared. p, in this case, was, we were saying to be t over k. So this simplifies to t squared divided by k. So um, if you repeat this process, like you know, t squared divided by t cubed times, and if every time you find an edge with this probability, then the number of edges you'll find in total will be this times this, uh, which is, or should be, uh, um, oh, sorry, OK, sorry. After you've done this kind of k squared of t cubed times, um, you will get a matching of size k over t, as claimed. OK, so lastly, I just want to talk about planar matchings. And this was a uh, very recent work. Um, again, kind of building off things which were in our soda paper, things that were in this nice soda paper from 2015. Um, so let me show you that. So actually, so our results are more general. Uh, as with the previous work, our results are more general than just finding, just finding matchings in planar graphs. They actually find matchings in graphs with bounded arboricity. Now, um, a graph has arboricity alpha. If any induced subgraph on R nodes has at most alpha R edges, or equivalently, um, it can be proved that it's equivalent to saying that it's possible to partition the set of edges of your graph into at most alpha forests, or alpha acyclic subgraphs. So, for example, there's a result that says a planar graph is possible to partition uh, the edges of a planar graph into most alpha disjoint forests. Uh, sorry, most three disjoint forests. Okay. Um, our main contribution here is um, not so much algorithmic, but more structural. So we, we define this quantity, A. A is a sum over all edges in the graph. And each entry of the sum, x, u, v, is just the minimum of one over the degree of u and the minimum of, uh, and one over the degree of v. OK? So first thing I'll try and prove is that 
this quantity A um, is closely related to the size of the optimum matching on the graph G if G has small arborosity. So uh, for a planar graph, this 1 plus epsilon is this 1 plus alpha is 4. So A is bigger than a quarter times the size of the matching, and it's at most 1.5 times the size of the matching. Um, so this is what I'm going to spend the next two slides on. Um, and you can actually kind of approximate A well uh, using n to the 4 fifth space, approximately up to a factor 1 plus epsilon. So by using this fact, this theorem here, um, you get a, a 6 approximation for matching. And actually, I'm going to show you how, or I'm going to hint at how they can actually be improved to a 5 approximation. Or in general, for a bounded arbitrary graph, you can get an alpha plus 2 approximation. So when alpha is 3, 5, but it works for any alpha. OK, so the lower bound, and it's not a computational lower bound, it's just proving A is bigger than this thing. Um, let's, let's do that. OK, so I'm again going to think about heavy and light nodes. So I have my graph. These are the um, nodes of degree greater or equal to alpha plus 2, I think I said. OK. Um, and so the, we'll call these H. And this will be the other nodes. So and a bunch of nodes here. OK. And these are other nodes. OK, um, um, some notation, let VH and be the number of nodes here, let VL be the number of nodes here, let EH be the number of edges here, let, v, let EL be the number of edges here. Okay. Um, yeah, and then just subgraphs on H now. So the first thing to argue is that, um, so remember in A, I have a quantity for every edge in the graph. And so the first thing to prove is that the sum of the weights of the edges here is at least the number of edges there divided by alpha plus 2, alpha plus 1. Uh, and that follows just because every node here has degree at most alpha plus 1. So when I take the minimum of the reciprocal of the, the, the degrees, like every edge here is getting weight um, at least 1 over um, alpha plus 1. OK? Like that. Uh, the second one's a little more tricky, but not too bad. So I now think about all the edges that are, like, have an endpoint on the left-hand side. So let's say the edges were of this form. OK? Let's say, let's pretend for a second there's no edges here, like within H. So all these degrees are smaller than the degrees here. So if I have a node of degree 3 here, each of these edges is going to get weight 1 over 3. Each of these edges is going to get weight 1 over 4, because then degree is 4. And similarly, 1 over 5, et cetera. OK? So, if you sum up all these, the weights of all these edges, and you can have, sum up all those edges, you get 1. Sum up all these edges, you get 1. Sum up all these edges, you get weight, weight 1. So if you sum up all these edges, you could just get back the number of nodes here, kind of VH. OK, but of course, there could be edges of this form. OK? The way you deal with those is follows. OK, so now I guess, um, well, actually, let's just. So this node is degree 4, and this node was now degree 5. So these 1 over 4s become 1 over 5s. And this edge is actually the minimum of 1 over 5 and 1 over 4, so it's 1 over 5. OK? So um, as, a, as a thought experiment, consider duplicating every edge internal to H. So this edge gets a duplicate. Um, if the weight initially is 1 over 5, and the duplicate, you put the other weight, 1 over 4. Okay. 
so, yeah. so replace every internal edge on the heavy nodes with two edges, one of weight, one of the first degree, and the other edge of weight, one of the second degree. This will increase the total weight of these edges by at most, well, let's say the extra edges we'll add are each of weight um, at most 1 over alpha plus 1. Oh, sorry, most alpha plus. Um, yeah, well, it's at most alpha plus 1, but I think that's like, it can replace by an alpha plus 2. So by adding, by duplicating those internal edges, you've increased the total weight here of all this stuff. But after you've done that, you can now say that the total weight is exactly the number of nodes here. So if by adding some, if by adding most this weight, that you get new weight VH, it must mean that the original weight was VH minus this thing, which is um, VH alpha plus one. And now this is where we use the alvarosity because the number of internal edges in this graph is at most alpha times the number of nodes in this graph. It's the only place in the proof we use arboricity. And so we can prove um, the total weight of edges um, with an endpoint in H is at most this thing. And um, you then can argue, well, and, and lastly, you argue that the number, like the size of the best matching is at most the number of nodes here plus the number of edges here. Because every, edging in the mat ed every edge in the matching must either be shallow or must take up one of the nodes here. So VH plus EL is bigger than the matching. And we know that the, our quantity A is greater or equal to the matching <laughs> divided by alpha plus 1 as required. Um, for the upper bound, how many minutes? Two minutes? Five minutes? Minus three minutes? Minus, OK. Uh, I'm almost there. That was definitive. OK. Uh, last observation is, maybe this um, was it will not have escaped some of you notice that the, the, the weights I define actually form a fractional matching. So what I mean by this is for every node u, if you sum up the edges of weight, uh, the, the edges of, if you sum up the weights of edges incident to u, then you get something that's less or equal to 1. So this is what's called a fractional matching. Uh, and it's possible to prove that the weight of, the of, the best of, the, of a fractional matching is at most 1.5 times uh, the matching of G. Um, I see this sometimes like, kind of cited, uh, citing a paper by Lobash. It also follows by something more general, which allows us to improve our result. So previously, I was defining XUV to be this thing. If I take the minimum of that with 1 over 1 plus alpha, then it's possible to improve that structural theorem to say that A is at most this times the matching of G and at least that times the matching of G. And so these two things differ by a factor of 2 plus alpha. So it means that if you know A, you know the size of the optimal matching in your planar graph up to a factor alpha plus 2. And the basic idea is the lower bound is unchanged. Um, you can generalize the statement about fractional matchings to say, to argue that you satisfy kind of odd sets constraints um, in Edmund's kind of characterization of the matching polytope to get a smaller number than 1.5. In particular, you get this number. And actually, this can also be, um, like you can actually improve on this in the case alpha is either even or odd. One of those two cases, not both of those cases. Um, cool, that's all I wanted to say. Thanks very much.